and, and welcome everybody. Um, I thought what I'd do today is give you some ideas of things that um, we might care to do in this extended period of time, uh, which is likely to happen because as we go into reopening, we'll start to discover that uh, situations such as the one at the Pioneer Flower Gardens uh, flower farm will happen again and again, and it's going to take a while before we get out of what we've where we're at in terms of self isolation. So, I thought I'd give you some ideas that we might um, consider um, in terms of family history, which is basically things that you know about yourself. So these are things that you could do now uh, without necessarily having to, having to leave your house, and I think that's important. And I think the first um, comment I'll make, and I'll make it again, is get started on something. Um, otherwise, you sit and maybe watch TV or do something different, and that's not particularly productive. Um, so one idea um, that I know numerous people have started to um, consider and are doing um, is to write about yourself and your immediate family as if your grandchildren were going to read this in 60 years from now. Because remember, um, you really almost have to have white hair before um, uh, you get to a point where family history actually means something and you want to pass on a legacy to those that come after you. Um, and very often, um, the, the, the standard comment is, uh, when somebody dies, a library is lost. In other words, when you pass on, um, you know way more than anybody else will ever know about your life. And it is interesting to people in subsequent generations. So, and you just don't know what your grandchildren might have liked to ask you now, but really aren't old enough um, to be able to understand that they need to ask now and not later. And so if you write it down, it would be really helpful to them at some point in the future. So think about the possibility of writing about yourself and your immediate family, perhaps. So for example, you start literally in your childhood and you work through your teenager period and into uh, your uh, pre-marriage period and then subsequently beyond uh, you know, into your, into your um, married life if, if, if you were married. And, um, and then you could also write about your parents as much as you remember, and possibly even your grandparents. So think about that as a way to get started. I recently did um, 20 pages on myself in the third person. Uh, you don't have to do it in the third person, you can do it in the first person. Um, so do it as a story that you're telling uh, to your kids. Um, and uh, I can tell you, it's probably the hardest thing you'll ever have to do in your life is actually write about yourself and decide what you want to pass on to your grandchildren and, and the way you want them to read it. So things that you want to say or should be saying uh, in your interpretation of yourself, um, which they would hear uh, and read going forward. So that's just a thought as a way of, of, of documenting things that you know that, uh, that subsequent generations in your family um, almost certainly don't know at this point in time. The second thing that I think would be helpful is to transfer whatever you have in bits of paper everywhere in baby shoe boxes or wherever um, onto a PC or a Mac um, and put that information into folders uh, in a, some logical way, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and have that information. And, and remember that, that, that doing family history is not necessarily about um, genealogy only, that is to say, not necessarily about just doing a family tree. This is, this is about collecting anecdotes and stories and, um, and photographs and other things that are compositely called genealogy, but which we tend to only think of the family tree, and that's not really what genealogy is about. It's about providing color um, to your family's history over a period of time. And very often, 
because you are the oldest and wisest and have been there the longest in this world, um, your words on a piece of paper could be really, really helpful. For example, I was uh, working on a job uh, trying to identify Laura Secord's um, descendants and found them um, in Norway. And uh, when I went to Norway, I discovered that there was a 15 page document written in 1928 by a grandmother who had described her whole family in Norway uh, in, in, in significant detail over a 15 page close type document. And that document was, had never been seen by people in North America. So it, it is really amazing what can be done if you put things down on a piece of paper, um, just describe things in your way because only you uniquely can do that. Um, and if you do it on a, on, a, on a PC or a Mac, at least then you have it and perhaps make a, um, make a, a, a printed copy of it as well, maybe put it in a three ring binder. Um, the next thing is that the internet has today lots and lots of information on family history that you may not be aware of. And it's certainly worth um, putting in people's names if you're looking for their obituaries or you're looking for other information about families. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet today that is worthwhile just looking through to see what you can do there. Um, if you want to have a little fun, um, you could buy, uh, it's about $100 US, um, a DNA test and see what results you get. I'll talk about those a little bit later in the talk here and um, you'll, you'll see more about um, what you might do there. This is a good time to be doing that, but try to figure out a time when there is a holiday when some of these testing houses give you a break on the cost of the DNA test. Uh, from that DNA test, you actually start to find unknown cousins. Um, I'm not sure what your opinion is about um, uh, writing to unknown cousins, um, but I've done lots and lots of that, and it's it's sort of fun to do to find out that you're uh, they're out there, um, and, and some of them are second cousins, or and in fact, we've even got down to first cousins who were adopted, and one of the things that I've done recently is uh, completed the finding the birth parents for about 15 adoptees in this local area of Niagara Lake. Um, so that sort of work is uh, quite complex sometimes, um, but nevertheless a lot of fun and it really can only be done by using DNA testing. And finally, if and when uh, this year, probably not, but certainly sometime uh, in 2021, the re library reopens, then the workshops that I've been giving there monthly for the last five years will continue and I will be doing more of that. So point number one, get started. You have time now. Uh, as, 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 as is stated, you could be unstoppable, but you just have to get started. So how do you get started on a PC and a Mac? First of all, you have to be organized and you have to think about, maybe the first thing you do is to decide what topic or what people, maybe yourself, maybe your parents, uh, maybe your grandparents, maybe one particular person in your family. Um, identify the topics, the people, the generation, and put them in folders so that um, all the information you have about that particular one is in that, that, that particular topic is in that particular folder and other fo other folders may have other topics um, and so you've separated out stuff already because the last thing you want to be doing is trying to write this stuff all at once it won't happen you have to do this thing when the spirit moves so do it at the time you have um, you, you're comfortable with it do a little bit at a time maybe two, three, four pages at a time would be excellent. Um, but you and sometimes you have to do some work to sort of figure out um, specific dates or places or whatever you did at various times in your life or other people's lives in order to be able to write the document. And that's 
part of putting a family history together. So I always say start with yourself and start with your close relatives if you if you've finished with yourself and then work outwards. So and you'll do it one line at a time. You one uh, descent line at a time. You can't do them all at once. It's too much work, but do them one at a time. And let's say when I talk about lines of descent, I mean let's say you've got four grandparents. There are four lines of descent right there. Um, so that's just a way of separating out and minimizing the uh, the feeling that you might have that this is a lot of work. It's much easier to do things in small chunks and do things uh, that way. And find and second and, and then beyond that, then add some flavor to it. Talk about the places, the lifestyles, the occupations, and add what photographs that you might have or what photographs your family, your cousins uh, may have. That means communicating with cousins you may not have communicated with for a very long time, if ever, um, because they too have photographs. Um, and what's more, it's interesting because nephews and nieces have a totally different opinion of your parents than you do as, as their children. And so that can happen. Uh, when I wrote the book on McNabb, we had a lot of nephews and nieces that had totally different opinions of the than the children had. And so um, that was a, an, an interesting uh, uh, education uh, to go through. Um, and then just write, just get started and start writing. You will find out what things you're missing afterwards. If you do lots of research first anticipating writing later you'll be doing bits of research and you'll run out of gas and you won't ever have written anything and as a result nothing will have been produced so don't rush it but just start writing and then leave blanks where you need to get information to add to what you have so there are always secrets in families. There's always flavors that you have to add to the family. Um, and so it's good to add the secrets and the, 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 the flavor. It's, today, a lot of the secrets that were held two, three generations ago are no longer. There are ways of finding out the, the truth or at least something much closer to the truth um, uh, it, but back in those days, it was not uncommon for um, secrets in families and, and, uh, and, and somehow you have to be able to uncover those. And writing them down may be something that your generation is the only way your family will ever preserve that, that information. Family genealogy then, if, if you have a family tree, you can get started writing right now. Um, if you need more information, there are ways of doing that. One of the ways is to go to Ancestry and take a short-term trial. Uh, by the way, this is a little bit old. Um, you can get a 14-day trial today. Um, if, you, if you take Ancestry for one month just to try it out and just to see what it has there, and you put in information, that costs $30 US for one month. Uh, if you do it for six months today, uh, it's actually only $130. So they've actually reduced their price somewhat. Always get uh, everything they have. Don't just get Canada alone, which is obviously less a price because many of you are descended from people in Europe. And uh, so getting the information from Europe is almost essential for, the, for building their family tree or family genealogy picture. The Niagara on the Lake Library, as St. Catharines and other libraries locally have, they have free ancestry service, but unfortunately, they're not open at the present time. So you're not able to go that way at this point in time. But doing things from your own hearth side uh, in your home is uh, an easy way to get started and doing a trial 
can sometimes be very helpful to you to understand what's possible. And if you're not quite sure about things, just give me a call or send me an email and you'll see that information at the end of this presentation. If a, um, a family member already has a family tree, get a copy of it from them. You'll need it anyway. So try to get information that your siblings, um, your cousins already have, so that you've got a, an assembly of, of material that you can use to start to write. Because if they're not gonna write, you might be the person who does that for the family. Also, the photographs are absolutely key. Um, photographs of family members is terribly important uh, to preserve. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I have been the, uh, the, the holder of, of the family photographs for a long time. Uh, and, and frankly, I always told my parents, um, I don't care what else you give me, just give me the family photographs because I, you, can't, you can't buy those, you can't reinvent those. They, they are there uh, the way they are. Uh, and, and so in a, I have recently also been doing work with um, married British home children, the girls that came over to Niagara on the Lake in the late 1800s. And uh, we've been able to contact family descendants and find photographs of these girls uh, which would never have been available if we didn't have uh, contact with the families. So contacting your family to bring that information together is very important and very often people don't want to release their photographs um, to you They'd much prefer to make a photograph of the photograph, that is to say, use their iPhone or something like that, make a photograph uh, or scan the photograph on their printer and send you the scanned copy. And that usually is perfectly adequate for what your needs will be. So do tell your family what you're doing. You'll have to, because if you're asking them for information, um, you, might, uh, you might need whatever they have and any opinions they have or anything they have in, you know, in, in their collection somewhere, uh, in their shoe boxes. So just something that uh, you will almost certainly have to do if you go into this. Um, converting paper to a computer is particularly important because it means that you're no longer shuffling through bits of paper in a shoebox, you're actually having things organized in folders in your computer. One of the ways you can do that um, is to also buy a product called Roots Magic 7, um, the essentials version, which simply allows you to build a family tree and put lots of notes in there um, uh, is free. But if you want to do printouts and that sort of thing, then you'll have to pay the $30 charge, which is a one-time charge. It has four incidences. That means to say your daughter or your son or somebody else can also have <clears throat> use the same key as you're using. Um, and so it's, 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 a, it's a relatively inexpensive thing. I mean, gosh, you can, you know, you can pay that for lunch these days. Um, uh, and so having that on your computer, which you can download directly to um, your computer from the internet today. And I can give you the guidebook uh, for free that goes with that so that you don't have to uh, buy anything else other than the application itself. Uh, I rewrote the, uh, the guidebook a couple of years ago and um, all you have to do is ask me for a copy and you're welcome to have it. This is the sort of thing you see. Um, here you have yourself, uh, your parents, your grandparents, et cetera, and so forth going out. And immediately you start to see where you have gaps. For example, in my case, Margareta Evans, my, grand, my paternal grandmother, uh, was born out of wedlock. We do not yet know for sure who her father was. Uh, however, we've just recently discovered um, somebody who's a close connection who almost certainly was related to this man. 
and, and so we're getting much, much closer to the options that her father may have been. And so that's an example of um, situations where um, you're trying to fill in gaps uh, to, to answer questions and, and to give some more color uh, to your family history. Um, another way in which um, that same program shows the information is father and mother, top left, uh, the children below, uh, and, and the father and mother's parents on the top right hand side. And, and then if you click uh, on the little arrows on the right side or the left side, you can move forward or back one generation. So you can continue to move all through your family history uh, that way. Now, if you take one particular person like Richard Hemming, and you'll, you'll note that um, you can add all sorts of information uh, into what they call facts. You could add where they resided, what his occupation was. Um, you could put in um, the census uh, information where he was in say 1861 or whatever date it is. Um, in addition to that, and what's really helpful here is that all those anecdotes that you've got about this particular individual can be put in something called note down in the bottom in the right hand side at the uh, halfway down you'll see the word note and if you open that up you can see that you can start to add information in free form just like a word document and type in any amount of information you have on that particular individual uh, it, whether it's source information or whether it's, you know, where they were living at a, at a particular time or, which, you know, what his occupation was, whatever it may be, you can provide that information for yourself. So no longer do you have to rely on bits of paper in a shoebox. You take all those bits of information and you put them into individual notes uh, for each of the individuals in your uh, family tree. In addition to that, you can also look up cemeteries. Today, cemeteries have online services for lookup of the people that are buried there. For example, if you look at Forest Lawn in St. Catharines, 90% of the people buried in Forest Lawn are now online. You just simply have to type in the name of the person and up will come every um, everybody that's buried there. Um, of course, you have to have some chocolate to make it worthwhile. Um, the, the, the free internet information, I think, is important. Um, there, um, in the last decade, um, the internet has, has just exploded with family information. Uh, obituaries for the last 10, five, 10 years, if you go to St. Catherine Standard or you go to many of the newspapers, that information is available. To go to further back in time, you may have to pay a charge um, to get that information. But certainly the more recent um, obituaries and, uh, and other things are available today. Uh, often uh, wills and probates are available on Ancestry. So you can get that information if you'd like it. And um, what's really good is that you can email people to find out the data that you're seeking uh, and, and, give, and have them give you some advice on how to get it. If you're writing to a, a historical society or to a, a museum, uh, to, to uh, a, you know, a county record office or wherever it may be, uh, don't ask them to do work, just ask them to give you guidance on where such documents might be available and how you might get access to them. And it's amazing how much information you get back. Just amazing. Um, if you're writing, let's say you're from Eastern Europe, and you're writing in Polish or Ukrainian or one of the many languages of Eastern Europe, um, as well as Western Europe for that matter, uh, and you're not familiar with the language, 
You can use Google Translate today. It's on the web and it's an amazing product. It is simply is amazing. You type in in English on the left side and you have a choice of a hundred languages on the right side that you can put out. And then what you do is you take the translated information in say Polish or Ukrainian or whatever, and you put it back on the left side and see it back, come back in English uh, and make sure that what you had translated actually is what you intended should be translated. So if, you, if, if it comes back in English in a strange way, you'll have to change the, the way in which you've written the letter just to convey what it is you're trying to uh, provide. And I have, I, I've been complimented many times on my Polish. Um, I have no idea how to speak Polish at all. Um, so it's, it's a really helpful uh, tool that's readily available to you. And it's much better to write in that foreign language uh, to people from in that country than it is to write in English because then they've got to find somebody who can speak English. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, um, in, in terms of place names, um, Google Maps is fine. Go find out where a place is and see where the local villages are around it, uh, and, and maybe the local towns, because registration may have been in a local town but the actual birth or death or marriage or whatever it may be may have been in a small village close by so that's important and finally if you want to know anything about british home children you have a grandmother or a great grandmother who was a british home child then the ones that miss maria rye brought into canada from 1869 to 1896 and then beyond by our Western home in Rye Park uh, here in Niagara on the Lake that information is all on um, the um, is all on the museum the, the Niagara on the Lake Museum website if you're doing um, genealogy there are two ways of looking at it on the left hand side you look at yourself and your two parents and your four grandparents and your eight great grandparents, et cetera. But if you're doing DNA testing, you're actually communicating with people who are already your cousins. And what you're trying to do is find the common ancestors, hopefully two of them, maybe only one, uh, back in time, which will tell you how far, uh, uh, how well you are shared with, with, with that particular cousin in each case. So it could be a, a you remember that, that, that uh, grandparents produce first cousins, great grandparents produce second cousins, great great grandparents produce third cousins, et cetera, and so forth. So trying DNA testing could be fun if you're interested. Uh, I can certainly talk about it if anybody wants to. Um, I can make some suggestions. I do a lot of management of DNA testing for other people. And I certainly help a lot of people with the results when they get them back from DNA testing. So if your, if your daughter or your son uh, decide to give you it as a, as a, as a, as a, a present at some point in time, um, a birthday present maybe, um, it's something that would be amusing and fun to do and certainly give you a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of tasking to to go find who some of the closer cousins are to you that uh, show up on the DNA test. How do you do it? It's a, it's a bit uh, it's fairly simple there. They send you uh, a couple of uh, it's one of done by one of one of two ways they'll send you a um, a, a, a little stick with a with a um, a sponge on the end of it on the left hand end you can see there in the middle um, and you swab your cheek for about a minute and then you do this or half a minute and you do about you do the same thing with the other one on the other cheek and you put them in each of the two um, 
uh, vials that you see below, and you can see that on the stick, there's a red, there's a black mark there right in the uh, near, near the sponge end of the stick, and, and that breaks off so that it's just the right length to go into the vial. And you send those two off for testing, and then they come back with, with the results for you. The alternative is to spit into through a little hopper uh, that you screw onto the top, uh, and until, until it fills to a certain point in a tube, and, and then you put a cap on the tube and send that tube back for testing. The sort of th information you get, first off, is, is, is where your family is from overall. And what percentage of you is from which region of the world? That's really uh, an intriguing, sometimes uh, thought-provoking um, situation that you, re you, you face for about uh, and, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's probably half an hour's worth of fun um, to realize that you, you, you've, got a, you've got some Scandinavian in you, or you may have some Eastern European in you, whatever it may be, uh, and that could be really uh, interesting. But what, what you also get is all of those uh, close cousins to you, um, in this particular case, um, maybe not so close, third to fourth cousin, it's close enough for us. Um, <clears throat> and you can email every single person on that list. So all you have to do is click on the left-hand side and you can send an email to any one of those people and say, you know, who are your four, grandpa four, four, four grandparents and how, how, how might you be connected with me? I think the more you can do for them, the more likely you are to get a response. And in my experience, women tend to respond much better than men. Um, that's just the way they are. They're much better communicators than most men are. So let me give you an example of what we've done here in this family. Uh, here's my wife's uh, list. Um, on the left-hand side are all the people uh, from the closest uh, relative to the, the further away, um, the closest relative being our daughter. And uh, she has uh, about half the DNA of, uh, of, of, uh, of the two of us, my, my wife and I. Uh, so, so she has something... Uh, you don't have to know what CM means in the middle, that shared CM. You don't need to know what that is, except that you yourself should be counted as 6,768. And, and, and if, the, if, the, uh, if the child is half of that, then you know that it came from the right nest. She came from, he, he or she came from the right nest. Um, the next person down uh, is my wife's brother. So you get a feel for that sort of, and I will show you later a chart as to how to define uh, the closeness you are. And also each testing house gives you a prediction of how close these people are to you. So you don't have to do all the work yourself at this stage. They do at least tell you the order in which um, they, the sharing is with you. And on the right-hand side in yellow, you'll see that's the actual confirmed set of information that we have based on those that we've been able to put in our family history, family tree. Um, the ones in blue in that same column are actually adopted, those uh, people that were adopted out of the family, and we have found how they uh, got to be adopted out of the family. To have a first cousin who was adopted out of the family was a big surprise. Uh, because it meant once we knew who father was and by description, we knew exactly who that person was immediately. Um, so no secrets. There are no secrets in families anymore. DNA testing will, will expose all of that. Um, there is also something called an X match. Uh, you can see a column uh, towards the right. Um, and family tree DNA, FTDNA, uh, actually provides some testing of, of that. And um, you'll see that um, uh, 
some people do have an X match and some people don't. And then the other testing houses don't provide that information. So we don't know. Um, I will say, however, that if you're going to be tested, uh, Ancestry has by far the largest database of tested people to compare against. So they're probably the company you would go to first. However, if you want more health information, 23andMe does a really good job. Um, if you do either of those two tests, you can also move your information to the 5 million people that are on the database that Family Tree DNA has for less than 90, or for about $19. And it's really well worth it just to have that additional analysis capability um, going forward. So just up front, if you, if you have not done a DNA test and would like to consider doing one, go to Ancestry or 23andMe, and then uh, we'll add, we'll figure out how to add it to Family Tree DNA with you. The other thing that I've done uh, with this same chart is added um, uh, who is on the maternal side of my wife and who is on the paternal side. So anything that's in the sort of red end of the spectrum, the, the reds and oranges, they're all on the maternal side and anything on the blues uh, end of the spectrum are on the paternal side. So it just gives you a, a very quick look at how are we doing in terms of the share of people who've actually been tested. And sometimes that's helpful um, when you're trying to decide, do you need more information on a particular side of your family? So there's also a company called GEDmatch, in addition to Family Tree DNA. And they, they're not a testing house, but you can compare your information with others and you can put your information in there. Um, and it's just a placeholder that you might want to consider in the future. It's very, it doesn't cost anything by the way, that's really helpful. This chart shows um, the um, centimorgan count, the CM count that I showed earlier, um, shared between you and others. So you've got yourself in the middle there and you can see that if that's 6,700 or so, your child is going to be somewhere between 3,330 3, and 3,720, assuming that you and your wife had that child, um, or your husband, as the case may be. Um, and if you look at siblings, or you look at, uh, and by the way, one R means one generation removed. So if you look at one C, that's first cousin, 2C is second cousin, etc. And 1C1R is first cousin, one generation removed, or once removed for short. But it's nice to have this little chart around um, just to refer back to when you see uh, uh, the uh, information coming through on how close some of your cousins may be in the results that you might get on your DNA test. Um, if you are only related to half of that cousin or half of that um, sibling, um, because let's say one of the parents has married twice uh, and you're on one, you're in one under one marriage and that other person is under the other marriage, you'll only have one common parent there. And so you'll only be counting half of the DNA, not the full amount of the DNA. Um, in order to come up with what the relationship is between you and that cousin. And on the, um, and, and on the X match that I mentioned, this is an interesting way of describing uh, how to find your relationships to X matches. Um, if you are a female, that your point is right in the middle, the pink dot right in the middle, uh, your mother is the pink uh, uh, arm on the right side, and your father is the blue arm on the left side. And remember that a woman is an XX person. That is to say, the two X chromosomes come to a woman. No Y chromosomes go to a woman. So 
the only thing that comes from father to daughter is the X chromosome because a man is an XY person and a woman is an XX person. Um, and so the, uh, the daughter, the, 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 uh, the, the self person in the middle actually only gets the X chromosome from the father, which came from the paternal grandmother and so on. And if you go back in that direction, you will see. And the other thing is to notice that um, since the person in the center has two X's, the one X comes from father, the two X's that are in the mother are mashed down into one X. So bits of two X become the one X that is in the child. Just to repeat that, the two X's that's in mother, the, the right hand um, pink uh, uh, arc that you have around the center there, um, there's two X's in there and bits of those two X's come down into one X that gets transferred to the child. So what that means is that you and your brothers and your sisters uh, can be very different looking people, can have very different traits because what you particularly what you get from mother could be totally different um, from one sibling to another and so on generations back. If you're a male, on the other hand, um, all of your X chromosomes come from your mother. There are no X chromosomes coming from your father because what you get from your father is the Y chromosome. And so you are an XY as a male and all of the Y comes from father and the cobbled amount of one X comes from mother and so on all the way back. So if there is an X match and you are a male, the matches can only be in the uh, colored areas. So if you're looking at the center, that's yourself as a male. The next one back is on the right side is mother. That's pink, a pink arc. And the next one back is the maternal grandparents. And you keep going back generation by generation outwards. And you can see what bits are part of your X match and what are not. So that's really all I was going to say today. Um, if and when the uh, when the library opens up again and is fully open again, um, I've been doing monthly seminars there now for five years, um, and typically people come if they're beginners to the one o'clock show, uh, as it were, at, on a on a Thursday afternoon, and the three o'clock one is typically for people who've done a, a fair amount of work and are wanting to come and ask questions uh, about either um, genealogy or DNA testing. At the bottom of the page here is my contact details. If you want to email me, you're welcome to. If you want to call me, that's my cell phone number, but I'm, I can't escape. I'm also in the local telephone directory, and so our home number is there too. Or uh, Amy Klassen, I'm sure, would be delighted to pass on any email that she might get uh, to me um, that might relate to this particular topic um, if something comes to the museum. So you're welcome to contact me even when I'm isolated. Here's my detail. So I'm gone crazy, but I'll be back soon. And thank you very much to Jane Seabrook for the wonderful illustrations that we have. She is from Auckland, New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, David. We do have a couple questions, and I have a question too, or a couple questions. Um, 
my first question was with the DNA testing, I've seen some stuff online of people saying, you know, sometimes they're not accurate and, you know, you could get different DNA with one company and then do another company and get something different. Have you ever experienced any of that of doing uh, testing the same person with two different companies and having a different outcome? Yes, there are some, uh, there are some differences in the way each of these companies do their tests. And, and so there are some variations that you will get. Um, and, and so you, you have to live with that. Um, uh, but in general, you can get a good impression of the sharing between you and a cousin um, from any one of the tests that comes back to you. They, would, they, could, they very well will be different. There is no universal um, testing uh, algorithm that all the testing houses are using. And so they have to do something different. Okay. Uh, they, do, they, they do things differently because they're trying to emphasize different things in some of the analysis work that they get done. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. My other question was, um, I noticed when you were showing your, uh, your family tree, you had a, um, a Hemming as one of the last names, and obviously your name is Hemmings. So how, right. how much does that impact the research yes. when you're going back and seeing the variations of spellings and name changes yeah. and, and that sort of thing. That's a really, really good question. If you've got double A and double S in your name, uh, somewhere back in the generations, um, <laughs> Klassen is, uh, can yeah. be uh, different spellings at diff in different generations sometimes. Um, but in my case, my grandfather went into the Coldstream Guards in England and the sergeant made a mistake in his spelling of his name and say so became Hemmings. He was not educated and the army gave him as a full education. And so all his recommendations were the name of Hemmings. And so when he came out, he kept the name. And that's why the name of Hemmings is here now. Um, my uncle who was a lawyer said, no, I'm not going with that. So my father is Hemmings and my, and my uncle was, was Hemming. Um, but uh, going back in time, um, many, many of the enumerators were English in Quebec, for example. And if you look at the spellings of um, census records and other things, you'll find that um, the, uh, there, there are tremendous deviations in the interpretation of uh, somebody's uh, pronunciation of their name um, by uh, Anglophiles who've had to write this down. And if you go back further still, um, you get into the 18th, 19th century uh, and, and before where there's a great number of illiterate people and they were able to speak, but they were not able to write uh, or read. And, and so as a result, um, uh, it, it was only the scribe who could write down something. And so you have to interpret between um, what you believe is a reasonable spelling for the family name and what the scribe may have written that particular day. Right, very interesting. Um, so a question from uh, Craig Tallman, he, he thanked you for the talk and uh, saying that you're singing to the choir because he's uh, doing some research of his own. Um, and he says, uh, from what he understands, the Canadian census info is not available after 1921. Um, is that true? And are there other sources that you can suggest? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the, um, the British, uh, the British uh, law is that it's a hundred year rule. That is to say, in Britain, um, the last census record that came out was 1911. The Canadian rule is a 90 year rule. That means the last census record came out in 1921, uh, for, for 1921. In the United States, uh, the, last cens the, the last census that's available because they have a 70-year rule is 1940. And so if you go back to Canada for a moment, if you wait another year until in 2021, the 1931 records for Canada are coming out. Um, so that's a, I, you probably don't want to wait that long. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there, there is a lot of information that's been done by researchers um, that is available on Ancestry now. Um, and you also get the name, if, if you subscribe to Ancestry, you also get the name of the person that submitted the information to Ancestry. 
And so if you've actually done the research with church records and uh, other, other local records that are available, um, you, you get more information than is generally publicly available and you've been able to put that into your family tree. And so looking through Ancestry very diligently, um, and by the way, Ancestry is no different than the internet, garbage in, garbage out. If you put in the wrong, inf or, or we put in too much information and make it too complicated, uh, the internet will not give you a good result, neither will Ancestry, and vice versa. So you've got to somehow um, uh, put in different forms of information in, into Ancestry to try to figure out if that information really is there and, and you can get what you're looking for. Um, but you are getting to a point, and, and by the way, in Britain, for example, there are county record offices and asking for guidance, not asking for research now, asking for guidance from the county record office is incredibly helpful for Britain, for example. And, and we have the same sorts of things in Canada. Um, if in, in the case of adoptions, I know um, there are also adoption um, uh, databases that are available. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So there are all sorts of um, local things or community things that you can uh, research, um, but they may not be um, generally publicly available yet. Um, Luann Lynch had a question about Ancestry. She's been using it for quite some time. Um, and has kind of filled in a lot of her lineage there, but she wanted to know if there's a way that you can convert all that info from Ancestry into a local file rather than continuing to pay for your subscription on Ancestry. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, would, I would strongly recommend that putting something like Roots Magic on your computer, you can't do it on an iPad. It's got to do it on a computer. So it's got to be either a PC or a Mac, um, doesn't matter which type, but it, that, that's what, it's gotta be a computer. Um, if you if you put something like Roots Magic on your computer, you can download uh, a PDF. Uh, you can download a GEDCOM. It's called GEDCOM means GED, which is Genealogical Data uh, Com Communications. Uh, you can download a universal file called a GEDCOM of all the information that's on your ancestry file and upload it into Roots Magic on your own computer, which would allow you to continue to do your um, note taking. And that's the other thing is you can add lots and lots of notes on your, on say Roots Magic on your computer, uh, which you can't do on Ancestry. Right. So a lot of that anecdotes and so on and so forth can be added uh, once you've done. And if you don't know how to, to do the download, um, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you do it. I can send you a set of instructions. It's very simple. Perfect. And I think that's it for questions. A lot of hellos from people. So, and thank you thank for you. the presentation. Lots of great information, uh, David. So thank you very much. Again, David's email um, was on the presentation there. So, and you can also contact us if, if you uh, don't see it or can't find it. Um, he's always happy to answer people's genealogical questions or help. He's got a huge database of, of local names and other names. Um, uh, if you're searching your own family history, a lot of times he can run the name through and see what, uh, what he has in his research as well. So he's always helpful for that. So thank you very much, David, for joining us today. And next week, uh, we have Thursday, June 11th. We're doing the next lecture in our All Along the Waterfront series, which is uh, sponsored by Jeff and Lorraine Joyner. Um, we have Linda Fritz uh, doing a presentation called Queenston, the Inland Port. So hopefully you guys can join us next week and have a great day. Bye, everyone. <laughs>